Hello, 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 hello. Thank you for clicking on my channel. I'm Dami, Dami Diary. How are you? I hope we're all doing well. Today's going to be a fun video. I'm going to be recommending a book that I highly recommend. And it's going to be fun because I will give you the synopsis of the book. Then I will also give you like three bits and pieces for probably two different sorts of people as to why you will enjoy this book and why it will draw to you even more. And then towards the ending, some bullet points as to why this book might not be as enjoyable for some people, but those should not derail you. It's just something you should look out for so you can easily like, you know, move past it or maybe just speed read if you're not really that interested. The book is amazing, I promise. So today's book is Black Water Sister by Zen Cho. You know that one book that's on your shelf that you're like, eh, I'll read you later. Like, you're not really driving me right now. This was the book for me. I got this book last year towards my birthday. And initially, right, this is what happened. I had gotten all the books I needed. I did all the books I really, really wanted to read. And then someone else had asked me, oh, do you want to do it for your birthday? So I looked at my Goodreads. I was like, ah, this looks interesting. And I also looked what the book with like, a, you know, better star ratings, to be honest. And I got this book. And I just picked it up and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I went through it. I'm not going to say quickly because that would be a lie. I don't really run through books as quickly as the next person. But this kept me engaged. So this book is about Jess. Jess is a Harvard graduate who is moving back to Malaysia with her parents because... They can't really afford America right now. And while she's looking for a job, she's like, you know, why not? Why not just move with her parents? But the thing is, moving back to Malaysia, her parents don't have a house. So they have to live with their aunt, the brother's sister, while they can find their footing, find a house, while just kind of, sort of look for a job in Malaysia or out of the country, wherever. And while everyone is just trying to get their shit together, basically. But Jess starts to hear a voice. And it's not like the voices we all get. I'm assuming we all hear voices. <laughs> it's not like the voices you probably get like that you're conscious of it's just like a very distinctive voice but she doesn't really know who it's from and she dismisses it from time to time until the voice like threatens her and is like if you don't do this like if you don't listen to me if you don't help me your family will know you're gay because it's just as well is gay and for anyone who's in the closet relative, relatively that's a threat it's like it's a threat to your life come on and um <laughs> she pays attention to the voice and she finds out that the voice is her grandmother Ama. And it was weird for a number of reasons. Number one, she's dead. But number two, she wasn't really close to Omar. And anyone might wonder, why not just possess the body of your actual daughter who you knew? That's open and left a conversation while you, while you read the book. You find that out as well. But she then, you know, becomes Omar's medium, which takes a lot of convincing conversations, fighting, and unconsensual possessing, if that's the word. Being possessed without one's consent, if that's the word we're looking for. And the book goes on from there. Now, Amal has beef, shall I say, with the business tycoon. And the whole thing is that this business tycoon is trying to demolish the temple which Amal used to worship at before she died. And people used to worship, the, worship at the temple, so it's not like void. But the thing is, in, I guess, the government in this country and maybe some governments around the world, as long as someone has acquired a piece of land and has paid for it, you can really just do whatever you want with it, even though it's a religious setting or a religious land. And it's funny because in some other places as well, if something is publicly known as a religious setting, you can't really do much to it or about it. So it's the context is very interesting. Now that's the whole book. She needs Jess help to Jess's help to stop that from happening. And you just follow them through this journey. The concept of this book when I read it, when I finished reading it, I was like, wow, I wish I thought of that. Because this isn't really something from my reading, um, shall I say experience and slight expertise it's not something you see every day it's not the run of the mill murder mystery or romance that you can predict this i really did not know where it was going and towards the ending of a book where you can't really predict where it's getting to for me it gets frustrating but at the same time i was like okay i am curious to see how this book ends and it didn't really end how i expected it to but i'm content with how the book ended now to categorize onto how you will enjoy this book, I'm going to start with the family setting. If you're someone who has a very dysfunctional yet normal family, you will enjoy this book because Jess and her parents moving in with the family or into the family house, for anyone who has like, shall I say, prideful parents, you can understand how uncomfortable but necessary it was. So the whole deal was Jess's parents had moved to America for like a better life and now they're moving back to Malaysia but they don't have the money or the resources to get a house or an apartment to themselves. So they're living with the family that they left behind, and that can have some kind of, like, shame, embarrassment, or just some kind of, like, side eye from everyone else. And it was kind of, it was weird for them. You can tell that they're really uncomfortable, except for Jess. She doesn't really care. And they're just trying to, you know, make it through it, right? Number two, 
they're not really religious people. Now, obviously, they grew up and lived in Malaysia, Malaysia for some time before they had jazz, so they grew up in a religious setting. But moving to America, finding their own ideologies, they don't really, they're not really with the Christian folk like that. But then they move back to this, you know, this house, and the auntie and her kids and everyone around them is very religious. So in cases where they're they're going for like a church meeting or a sermon, there are moments in the book and there's dialogue where the parents are like, "Yeah, hey, we're just going because we live here. We can't really afford to lose." this free accommodation we're getting while we're funding our footing. And I found that very interesting because I've seen that in real life scenarios where you're staying with someone or someone someone is doing something for you and you just don't want to make them so uncomfortable, even though that makes you feel uncomfortable. So you're doing everything to appease them so they don't notice that like they're actually doing you a favor and they like, you know, retract that said favor. At the beginning of the book as well, you meet the extended family like off the room. They're having conversations, they're like having drinks, they're talking, and immediately you can tell the kind of family it is because they're gossiping and you meet the one you meet the one auntie who is trying to put Jess with someone is like oh you know Jess you would really like that guy his dad is rich and that you know that thing where everyone knows everyone and like there's always that someone who's gossiping about someone and like everyone goes quiet because it's like how do you know that more inform- how do you know that much information and stuff and that's just how you meet the family and that's the dynamic and that's how it is so it's like Jess and her parents are kind of the outcasts but at the same time Jess being an outcast makes her fit in with the family a lot more. But her parents are just not wanting to be the mix and the fold. And I find that very interesting, very refreshing as well, because the moment I was reading and there was like dialogue happening, I'm like, I wonder if like the author was like eavesdropping while she was writing the book, you know, eavesdropping at my house, because it was very relatable and that was very comforting as well. If you are someone who is either questioning your sexuality or has a sexuality that is like sexuality or identity that's completely different from like the societal norms and what you grow up with you will relate this book as well and there is some sort of like hot tugging so just moving from america she has a girlfriend who is indian right and number one why i highlighted that is because her parents already and the people in her family ideally want you to marry someone who is from their own descent which is like malaysian or korean descent as well so her dating a girl who is indian is like already like two waving red flags already for her and she feels uncomfortable and like in her inner dialogue she's worried as to how that might even come across even if it was a guy that was Indian as well and while she's having internal dialogue with her grandmother as well which brief intermission when she's having conversations with the grandmother right initially she starts by talking out loud because she doesn't really know what is going on and how it's happening but then later she gets a bit more comfortable with Ama and she can now talk internally in her head and they're having like dialogues and they're trying to make decisions and they're having conversations internally while like, so she's probably like talking to a guy and Amar's in her head saying, oh, he's ugly, he has no money, his dad was like, you know, dumb in high school. And I really, really enjoyed that aspect of it. It was very, very intriguing. So while she's doing like the most mundane things and she's going for like a coffee, she's having some conversation with grandma in her head and like there's cases where she would like exclamate out loud and people would look at her weird and she's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. So she puts her earbuds in and she's like pretending to have a phone call. I really, really enjoyed that. It felt very realistic to me. And I enjoyed, you know, reading through the conversation throughout the whole book. Now, her being gay was a problem to her because number one, she didn't really know if she was going to come out, how coming out would be, or if she was just going to wait for her parents to die before she got a bit more comfortable in her relationship. But the opposite ends for her girlfriend. Her girlfriend is out to her parents. Everyone's cool with her. Her friends are cool with her. You know, her parents even know Jess. And she's like, well, I can't really keep living this life, which is a very common dynamic in the LGBTQIA community, right? The ideal plan was for Jess to find a job closer to her girlfriend or in her girlfriend's university as well, so they can be together. But throughout the whole book, the whole plan gets uprooted and the whole relationship actually goes a bit haywire and a mess. And that was, while a lot of shit, I promise you, a lot of shit is going on, when it gets to like parts of the relationship where Jess has to have like, obviously because of time difference, she has to have like a FaceTime call middle of the night or under her cover because she doesn't want anyone to hear or see who she's talking to or having like a romantic conversation with. It was pulling on my heart. I could relate a lot more to it than I wanted to and it was very uncomfortable in the best ways because the writer really portrays how those kind of relationships that are discreet and in the, you know, in the closet are and I really, really appreciated that. So that was really good as well. If you're someone who is not confrontational, you will relate to this a lot more than you expect to. So you see how I talked about how sexual identity, family, religion, everything else in between. Well, while this is going on, 
and while she's actually having a lot of spiritual warfare, for lack of better words, her parents and her family is nagging on her about a job. They're talking about getting a boyfriend, getting married to a rich person, getting married to someone of Korean or Malaysian descent in the country, talking to her about an apartment. Her parents still trying to get an apartment, but still nagging on just about money. All this is going on, and in her head, she's like, well, everyone should just leave me alone while I sort everything out myself. I don't even want to be here. I want to move in with my girlfriend. This is obviously before shit goes left. And you can see that she's having to go through so much with no one to talk to, and it gets a little bit more heart-wrenching when her relationship with her girlfriend doesn't really work, you know, as smoothly as, as, as it does in the beginning of the book, and she's a bit alone, and she's just battling her thoughts. Obviously, Amar is there as well, and Amar is even re- she, Amar's not, like, a helpful ghost. You would imagine someone who's coming back from the dead to, like, do some unfinished business. you think they would be as helpful, but she's actually just a very judgmental grandma in your head, and that sounds excruciating, like, I'm being so serious. So she's battling all of that in her head, and she's still not having anyone to talk to, when she gets confronted or, like, when something, you know, is brought to light, she quickly dismisses it. And I think you would enjoy that as well because I related to it as well. I don't think I do. And I'm still not confrontational. So, you know, it's what it is. But those are the three things that I think would and should, you know, push you to read this book even, you know, a lot more because I think the writer did a good job in identifying and just bringing some dialogue that you might have internally to light. I really, really enjoyed, and I, this is like for anyone who reads as much books, right? I just enjoyed reading a lot more about people's spirituality because while you discover Amma and how she's a ghost and like the god or goddess she worships, you then find out about a lot more gods in this book. And I really find that interesting to just read, see people, see how people worship, see you know who people adhere to. I find that really interesting, comforting, and educational to read about. One more thing, I promise, one more thing. I just want to spoil it, but the best things happen when Jess is going about her day. Right? She's going about her day. And because she can now communicate with the ghost, there's a moment in the book where she goes to like a temple and she can see past the human eye. So she can see the undead, quote unquote. But it's not like a regular thing. Something just happens that makes her see unusual things. And she could see how normal it was that like, people who were just not alive anymore were still existing in, like, you know, the earthly plane or the earthly realm. Earthly realm. And I, I find that fucking cool to just read and, like, visualize in my head. But that is it. That has been Blackwater Sister by Zentro. I really hope you pick it up. And if you've read this book, please leave in the comment below what you think about it, what you thought about it, what you didn't like about it. Let's have some discourse. But I highly recommend If you read this book, I don't like it. Come back and scold me because it's really really good but i'm giving you a heads up on what you should expect and i hope everyone likes it thank you for kicking my video if you know someone who you think would enjoy this book feel free to share comment if you've read this book and i hope you come back next time we're talking about more books or recommendations Bye bye